Hi everybody and thank you so much for being here today. My name is Amy Bryant with Parenting Beyond Punishment and Wild Child Counseling and I'm here today with our final interview for our No Swank Challenge and I'm here with um, two very special people, Robin Peters Bennett of StopSwanking.org and Dr. Elizabeth Gershoff who has just published this latest article on research and I'm so excited that she is going to be speaking with all of us today. So uh, now I just would like to introduce Robin and she's going to take it from here. Thanks for being here. Hi oh, Robin. Hey Amy, it's great to be here. It's good to be here with Dr. Gershoff. Um, it's an honor really. Uh, Dr. Gershoff has been studying the effects of corporal punishment for 20 years. Um, she's been chasing the question of you know, really um, what effect does spanking actually have on children in all of the ways that we spank children. And um, she is the Associate Professor of Human Development and Family Sciences in, at the University of Texas, Austin. And she's also a mother of two children. And just welcome, uh, Dr. Gershoff. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Robin. Yeah. So I thought um, it sounds like, uh, so Amy's going to sort of watch the comment section and, and, and let us know if people have any questions. So I'll just start talking about some of the things I'm interested in with your science and we'll go from there. Sounds great. Um, so the first question is, like, particularly if you're following this topic, is why another study at this point? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, I did another meta-analysis back in 2002 that got a fair amount of attention. And back then I thought, okay, this is it. We have all the research. We don't need any more research on this. But questions remained, um, both in the public and in the research world. And so uh, my colleague Andy Grogan Kaler and I decided to do another meta-analysis. And we really wanted to address two kind of nagging questions. One was, is it, are, are the effects that we see of spanking really from the uh, harsh methods? Because in my first analysis, I included things like people hitting children with objects. The reason I included that is because one in four parents to this day still uses objects to hit children. Mm. If one in four parents are doing something, that seems like it's normative. It may not be something we like, but it, it's how parents are defining it. But I could understand why people thought that was not good to include. Um, so this new analysis takes out anything that involves hitting with objects or anything that looks really like it could cause injury, so kicking or beating or um, obviously biting or things like that. Um, so anything harsh we took out, we looked really just kind of basic physical punishment, basic spanking. Um, and so we took all the research we could find uh, from the last 50 years and found 75 studies that um, looked at some form of spanking. And we um, took their research and averaged it uh, and included how many kids were in each study because that gives us a sense of how strong that effect is and then um, looked at the average effect for 17 different outcomes. Um, and I realized I'm getting into the effects and you really wanted to know more just about why. But <laughs> That's okay, you <laughs> can just okay. finish your sentence I'll and then I'll just back going. up and go, whoa, I'm okay. back here still, it's fine. That's right. <laughs> um, and so you know, our main goal was to see, is spanking achieving what parents want? Parents' main goals when spanking are to improve children's behavior in the short term and to increase their better behavior in the long run. And so we wanted to see, is that true? And, um, and that's why we did this meta-analysis. Okay. If people thought about it, a lot of the spanking happens when they're angry. Um, and that it's not... There was a really interesting clip that I saw um, that Joan Durant put, uh, sent around yesterday of a newscaster in New Zealand who said that she had been really in favor of spanking before she had kids. And then when she had kids, she realized the times that she wanted to spank her child, it was not when the child was misbehaving. It was when she was at her wit's end. She was the one who was really upset. And she, so she stopped. And so it's, I, I don't know that you could really, it's hard to differentiate for me between the angry anger levels of parents when they're spanking. I think, right. um, to, and to me that's almost beside the point. Yeah. Um, because hitting is hitting. And in any other relationship, hitting is hitting. And we don't, it doesn't really matter if you hit somebody really hard if you were angry or not. Right. You know, we don't really ask if a husband hit a wife when he was angry or not. We don't ask if 
somebody punch somebody in a bar and they weren't angry. I mean, we don't ask those questions, but for some reason we ask that when we're talking about parents and children. That's interesting, isn't it? It is. And it's partly because of the um, education that's been offered around spanking. It makes that a criteria and then somehow um, allows it, uh, sort of puts it in a different light, like this is different than hitting mm -hmm. because you're not angry right. or that kind of thing. What about frequency? Because other parents will say, you know, I rarely use spanking and so I just don't think a tap on the bottom is that big of a deal and that your research is probably looking at parents that are kind of compulsive spankers or that kind of thing. Well, so half of the studies we looked at look, uh, are looking at people who ever spank. So it's just comparing ever or not. So it would capture all those people who just do it once or twice a year or even once or twice in a child's life. And we still are finding that spanking is linked to these negative outcomes. But what I would say to parents who are hitting only once or twice, that if you're only hitting once or twice, you probably don't need to be doing it at all. You have other methods that you're using all the time. Um, and so when it looks like spanking is working, it's because we are doing all these other things with our children that do work, using positive discipline and, and talking with children about why they should behave appropriately. Those are the things that are teaching children to behave. And if they do learn those lessons, it's not because of the spanking, it's in spite of it. So we looked at 17 different outcomes. Most of them were in childhood, a few were in adulthood. Um, and we found that 13 of them were statistically significant, and all of them were in the direction of a negative outcome for children. Uh, we found that spanking was not linked with better compliance. Uh, it just wasn't related to compliance at all. Um, and in the short term, like immediately. Right. And then everything else is looking at kind of longer term outcomes of spanking. So uh, children are not better behaved in the long run. They're not more pro-social. They're not kind of empathic. They're not kind of the positive things that parents want their children to be doing. They're not doing more of that. The more children are spanked, the more aggressive they are. And that's a pretty clear lesson. Children are learning that you can use aggression to right. get what you want. Um, they're more, uh, they have more antisocial, so they have more behavior problems. They also have more mental health problems like depression or anxiety. Uh, they have worse relationships with their parents. Um, and then the, the main serious one we found in childhood was the link with more, the high, this higher risk for physical abuse. So that it links up with child abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, it doesn't mean that everybody who spanks abuse, I mean, in this country, I should say in other countries, any kind of spanking is considered abuse. In the United States, we don't consider spanking abuse, so we have drawn this kind of arbitrary line. Right. Um, and so in this country, not everybody who spanks abuses their children. That's definitely not the case. It's just that it makes it more likely. And when we look at cases of families, parents who have physically abused their children, 75% of them started out as discipline. So they've been found to have physically abused their child, and the, the investigators go and say, what happened? And they say, well... He kept bothering me. I was talking on the phone, and I just wanted him to shut up, and, you know. It escalated. It escalated. And, and so yeah. the most tragic part about that is the parent is not a sick parent. They're not a crazy parent. They're just a frustrated parent, and all of us become frustrated at times. And they got carried away. They just hit for too long or too hard, or they used an object and it injured their child. And that was not their intention. Their intention was yeah. to discipline. So it's true that correlation is not causation. People like to say that. That's definitely not true. Right. But what is true is that correlation is the first necessary step for causation. You have to establish that two things are related to each other before you can show that one causes the other. So this is the first step. We're just saying these two things are very, very strongly related to each other. In 99% of the studies where we found a statistically significant effect, we found a negative effect. A negative, I shouldn't say effect, I should say a negative outcome was associated with spanking. So none of the study, basically one study found a positive outcome and that was a weird study that looked at um, guys in the army in the 1970s stationed in Germany and asked them if they had less opioid use and they had less opioid use if they reported being spanked as a child so okay that's great for those guys but that's a very unique, <laughs> that's very very unique situation <laughs> when we're talking about the rest of the studies we're not finding any positive outcomes linked with spanking so if spanking were good okay if spanking did work we should find all of the associations in the other direction. We should find that it's associated with more compliance and less aggression and more um, better relationships with parents and less mental health problems. We don't see that. All the outcomes are in the other direction. So I think people seem to think that I'm out there looking for bad outcomes and I, I'm always looking for the good ones. They just don't ever come out. They're always coming out in the opposite direction. 
this conversation is more than science, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a good friend who is um, comes from a very devout family, very Christian, and they are uh, very family oriented. They really care about children. They're very ethical people, uh, but they are pro spanking. She is not, and so part of her conversation is often talking about the research, but then also talking about the religious, you know. Mm -hmm ideology and and coming from the heart and trying to share that view and then to trying to tie in the science and I'm wondering if you could speak to um, what pieces of the science are really important to hang on to uh, when you're weaving them into the deeper issue of you know how do we relate to our children and because you know of course it's very hard to change someone's mind unless they're connected to you you know mm -hmm. uh, you know logic isn't enough sometimes <laughs> right <laughs> right exactly I, I think the way to connect to people is that we all have our children's best interests at heart. I mean, I think every parent at some level has that. I mean, even parents who sometimes abuse their children often love them. Um, and so we all, I mean, I think it mean, it's a matter of getting to that point. And if you know something is not good for your kid, why would you do it anymore? And so the science is trying, we're trying to inform people about that, that, you know, it's as if, you know, we, you know, one example I like to give is that when I was a child, there was no seatbelts in our car. Like my parents' car just didn't have seatbelts, so we didn't have seatbelts, didn't have car seats. You know, we were just bouncing around. Right. And you know, nowadays we would think that's terrible. I mean, it's illegal to put your child in a car without a car seat. How did we get there? Well, and partly through science. Science did lots of experiments to show that when people were restrained by seatbelts, they were less likely to die in car accidents. Great. So we passed laws, and people now wear seatbelts, and you know, people are horrified if any person has a child in a car without a car seat. We've learned. We've learned from the science. Sure. However, so, I would say that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm just saying that I think that we can change, and I think we can use that science to kind of change. If if people understand it all is coming from a good place, I mean, that you know, this is not about judging people. This is about learning from the 160,000 people that were in our research. Yeah. We can learn from their experience. Um, and you know, maybe adapt our own behavior. Yes. There was a little piece you said, it was about, I'm, I'm not going to make the link perfectly, but the thought that came into my head that I've had the conversation is, well, you know, this science has a liberal bias. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard this? Oh, I hear yes, this yes. All the time. And so it's like, well, and you know, I mean, people that know me know I, uh, my attitude towards children is probably a more liberal perspective, and but it's deeply uh, embedded in also neurobiology, and I do try to lean into that to help them understand that. But I do appreciate that there's a little bit of um, a fear, like is the science slanted? Is it? Is it? You know, I had a psychiatrist who clearly understands medicine one time say to me, "Oh, when when I first brought this up, and goes, oh, they probably have an axe to grind." <laughs> And that's unfortunate. I and mean, I think I've been struggling with that a lot because it, Americans seem to not trust science for some reason, unless it goes along with their beliefs they already hold. Yeah, it's hard to, you know. I mean, there's still people who think that climate change is not happening. You know, I mean, there's tons of science on that. Those people will probably never change their mind. I mean, I, they're not accepting the science for whatever reason. I don't know what their motivations are. I think with parenting, there's very personal motivations. You know, this was I was raised this way, and I raised my child this way, and I don't want to be questioned, and I I want to believe that my parents did the right thing, and I want to believe that I did the right thing. Yeah. And those are very emotional, you know, value laden things that are very hard to, you know, I, and I don't want people. I don't want to again. I don't want to criticize anybody's parents. I mean, I think the the seatbelt example. I don't criticize my parents for not putting me in a seatbelt. They didn't know any better. They didn't even have the tools. So I don't think my parents were bad parents. But now that they are grandparents, they put their kids in seatbelts. You know, I mean, they they have changed their behavior. And I'm not going to repeat their mistakes just because I can, just because they did it. I am learning from them. I'm learning from the science um, and changing my behavior. You know, even if it sometimes seems like. I mean, in like in like a seat belt, that doesn't really go against values necessarily. Although there's some people that think that they have the individual right not to wear a seat belt, but um, you know, I think people have the same belief about spanking. They have an individual right to do this. Yes. Um, but well, 
the, also there's the research. I, I remember uh, talking to Dr. Murray Strauss, and he said, you know, smoking was the same way because he was a smoker. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he was a smoker and a smoker, and then he had to give them both up. But he said, yeah. I liked smoking. And I think, I don't think parents would say, I like spanking, but they would feel like, hey, you know, you take that away from me. I'm already struggling. Or, you know, yeah. like, what are you giving me instead? And so, in a way, but there was science then too, but the science I've heard for the smoking is very similar to the kind of science we have looking at spanking. Oh, yeah. It's correlative. It's can right. you kind of help us understand how they're the same? Because people don't question smoking anymore, even though they still do it. <laughs> right, exactly. But there was a time when they were there. There was, there, you know, there were several decades where the research existed, but people still questioned it. Um, and so it is similar in that it's correlational. We, again, we can't randomly assign people to smoke or not. Um, in the lab, they did with animals. Of course, they randomly assigned mice to get, you know, smoke inhalation or something like that. We, and we can't really do that with people uh, and discipline. Um, but what we can do in the science is, uh, as I said before, we can do these longitudinal studies and use lots of control variables to say, okay, we're going to take out all these other variables that could be related to both spanking and to uh, kids' behavior so we can isolate as much as possible the link between spanking at one time and a change in a child's behavior. If we see a change in the behavior, and we can link it to spanking, that's the best evidence we have that spanking is actually the cause of it. We can never absolutely rule it out, right. but what I would say is there's no evidence, no evidence in the other direction. There's no evidence that's showing me. that spanking is related to better outcomes. And so, yeah. That should you know, tell you something right there. It's yeah, like, I mean, and I've looked, and so to get to that question of being liberal, I'm sorry to talk over you, but no, um, it's okay. I mean, the data that we have, we have put every single study that we looked at in our paper, all the effect sizes, the statistics are there. So anyone can check what we did, and I expect people will. So yes. we're not hiding anything. You know, this right. is not, we don't have an axe to grind. I mean, we, we feel strongly about this issue. That's why we spent se several years studying it. Yes. Um, we were open to seeing, I mean, I actually didn't think we would find such consistent results. I thought, well, we'll find a couple things. Yeah. But it's so amazingly consistent. It's just, yeah. you know, stunning, really. Yeah, I mean, and any person, anybody could redo the same analysis, and they would find the same thing. 